The sport of whitewater slalom is so little known in this country, but I want to, but I want to lead off with some short video clips just to give you some idea of uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, this is uh, what the sport looked like when I first started, 1968 National Championships on the West River, Jamaica, Vermont. Uh, whitewater slalom is a race through a course defined by slalom poles hung over the water. It's against the clock with penalties added every time you hit a gate. We'll see, ah, nice banging hitting the gate there. Uh, there are three kinds of boats used right at the moment. We're seeing the uh, C2 or doubles canoe event come down, 1968. And now we jump ahead 43 years to last year's trials for the world championships. This is a kayak coming down. Kayak class threading around the poles. Here's the singles canoe, or C1. Uh, notice the concrete walls. This is an entirely artificial course. The water is pumped up to recirculate to provide the drop. Uh, no river is needed. This is the uh, doubles event again, coming around, modern doubles canoe. OK. At one point, the event organizers here suggested that I speak on the theme life after the Olympics. And I, uh, I thought about that and I decided I couldn't really talk about life after the Olympics because even though I've spent periods of time thinking that I was living life after the Olympics, the Olympics have kept looping back around again into my life every 20 years like a comet or something. I first raced, uh, I was just shy of 20 when I first raced in the Olympics in 1972. Uh, 20 years later, I was just short of 40 when I raced for the second time in the Olympics, 1992. And this year, 2012, my son, as you heard, is uh, an Olympic hopeful. Uh, when he's home, I go out with him and hold a uh, stopwatch or a video camera and try to act as his coach. So here they are again, the Olympics looming large in my life. The other thing I realized working on this talk is that I've never really gotten my head straight about the Olympic Games. Uh, so I guess my story is how the Olympics knocked me off balance, how I've tried to recover my partial successes and my uh, current failure. I hope that failure, too, can be illuminating. It may be that part of my problem is that I never saw the Olympics coming in the first place. I was not one of those kids who grew up dreaming of making an Olympic team. Uh, the idea was sprung on me out of the blue when I was 16. When I first got into whitewater canoeing, I didn't consider it a sport at all. It was purely for fun, recreational, going out with my, uh, with my older brother, my mother, uh, and having fun on the river. The only, uh, what we did was nothing like Olympic competition. The only canoe and kayak events in the Olympics were flat water sprint events and very specialized boats you could never take down a rocky river. What's more, the Olympics were for athletes and at that age I was not a particularly good athlete. I played a lot of sports because we had mandatory athletics in our school. And for the most part I enjoyed getting out and being active. But I was clumsy and small for my age and slow and uh, I never uh, was more than mediocre in school sports at that time. Then when I was 16, the rumor went around that Whitewater Slalom was going to be included in the upcoming Olympics. And my brother came to me and said, OK, Jamie, let's train up and make the Olympic team. Uh, I found it almost impossible to believe that our tiny backwoods dirt bag sport was going to be included in the Munich, Munich Olympics uh, to be uh, uh, held on a multi-million dollar artificial course and broadcast worldwide. Uh, it sounded crazy. But I said, OK, sure, let's train up for the Olympic team. Uh, whoops, did I miss a page? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, in that moment, I didn't take it very seriously. Uh, but my brother was not kidding around. Uh, he, uh, the next summer, we traveled around Europe, spent all three months behind the Iron Curtain and back. Uh, finding out, racing every race we could, and finding out just how bad we were compared to the Europeans. This was a strange transition for me, and I think for most of the U.S. paddlers, because uh, we'd gotten into it just for fun, and now we're being challenged to make it a really serious, full-time commitment, the way it was for a lot of the European teams. Luckily, we're still the same eccentric, enthusiastic river rats we'd always been, and we somehow managed to find a way to, to uh, uh, train hard and still enjoy being out on the river. So I ended up at age 19 as an accidental Olympic medalist in our accidentally included sport. And that was great. But then when I got back to college, I found it hard to wake up from the Olympic dream. 
it was announced not long afterward that slalom would be pulled out of the Olympics again. It had been easily slipped in as a new event, not a new sport. And it was just as easily slipped out again. And that was a big problem for me because I'd been changed. I'd caught the fever, five ring fever as we call it. Uh, with the Olympic goal taken away, I had a hard time getting excited about the lowly world championships. Nor did getting good grades or uh, finding a job or having a career seem quite thrilling enough. After graduating from college, I tried to satisfy my five ring fever by attempting to make the 1976 team in the traditional canoe kayak sport flat water sprint. Uh, this would be a little bit like trying to switch from uh, figure skating to speed skating, two very different events. Uh, it was a worthy effort, but I failed to make the 76 team. Now the failure in itself was not what I would call a mistake. You can't have goals without having failures. My mistake came afterward in my response to that failure. I decided to keep training in sprint, but with a new attitude. I decided I'd been too easy on myself. No more of this having fun stuff. I had to learn how to sacrifice. Now there was my mistake. Sacrifice is a dangerous word. In one sense, it's true. You do sacrifice. You do, you, there are always trade-offs involved in striving for any goal. To say one big yes, you must say a thousand little no's. But when you think of terms of sacrifice, it's all too easy to sacrifice the more important things to the less important. A lot of people choose to suffer because they think they're supposed to. They think that suffering is the payment they have to make to deserve success. That's how depressed gold medalists and um, drug abusing stars and unfulfilled billionaires are made. They sell their precious lives away for a handful of credentials. We see that. Valuing fame over living can be especially dangerous in the risky side of whitewater sport. It's so not worth it. The whole game is to pursue your goals without sacrificing. You shouldn't have to sacrifice because there's always enjoyment to be had in almost anything you do. If you can't find the joy in what you're doing, then you're off track. You're either pursuing the wrong goals or pursuing them in the wrong way. Time to step back and reevaluate. I finally reevaluated and figured out how to have daily goals and medium goals and goals closer to home. I won't go into all my life's twists and turns. One of my, well, my most rewarding project was raising four children, but I don't have anything very original to say about being a parent. Putting all thoughts of the Olympics aside, I got into whitewater expeditions. Oh, I already did that, okay. And uh, back into whitewater competition. Along the way, I picked up a hard training and fun-loving partner, Lecky Haller. First year we raced together, we placed second in the World Championships. And then, once more to my complete surprise, it was announced that Whitewater would return to the Olympics in 1992, Barcelona. Accident number two. At this point, I would like to tell you that I just kept doing what I loved doing without any special focus on the unexpected Olympic eruption. But uh, yeah, that would be a lie. No, here it was again, five ring fever so strong that uh, we moved for the entire year before the Olympics to a little town in the French Pyrenees uh, so that I could easily drive over the border and train on the course in Spain. My entire family came along. I still can't quite believe my wife was uh, willing to uh, conduct her business from France, uh, supporting my Olympic addiction and take care of the four children whenever I was away, which was a lot but I think maybe she had the fever too. I was twice the age I'd been in my first Olympics. Uh, that may sound like a disadvantage, but I knew a lot more. I was stronger, I was in better shape. My technique was much better. But of course, the sport had developed as well. The competition was tougher. Lecky and I had a good race and placed fourth. Although I was delighted to be there and happy to race well, I do confess I was also somewhat disappointed. I wanted one more taste of Olympic glory. And it was striking, it was almost funny, the gulf of difference between placing third, bronze medal, and placing fourth. The ancient Greeks, you know, didn't give awards for second and third. You either won or you lost. But for no particularly good reason, the moderns decided that the top three are honored and the rest are footnotes. The arbitrariness of Olympic glory has increased to an almost absurd degree in our sport because partic particip participation is limited yeah, for, Olympic, for the Olympics, to one entry per event per country. That means, means for, example, for example, that the number two ranked doubles team in the world will not get to race in London because they happen to come from the same country, Slovakia, as the number one team. 
right now in our sport, the World Championships are a far fairer and more competitive event than the Olympics. But it's the Olympics that gets the spotlight. Admittedly, the entry limitation just adds slightly to the already myriad of random factors involved in glory and success. There are thousands of random elements from your genes to where you were born to the whim of the public to the way the wind blows. And I have to say it's probably a good thing that there's randomness to success and failure uh, because it keeps you from taking them too, too seriously, or at least it should. Uh, there's a line from a Kipling poem that I always think of in this context. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. I have made some progress over the years. I don't beat myself up over my failures anymore. Sometimes I even feel that I'm there. But then that 20-year mark rolls around again. I'm there to the point where I can treat those two imposters just the same. But then that 20-year mark rolls around again. In just 12 days, my son will race in the Olympic trials. You know, find that. And I find myself, once again, in the grip of five-ring fever. I kind of wonder how it's going to hit me 20 years from now, in 2012, 2032, rather. <laughs> Thanks.